Happy New Year's Eve, everyone. We have made it to the end of this incredibly bizarre year that has been 2020. And it is that time once again for me to talk about my 10 favorite films of the year. But before we get into that, there are obviously quite a few things that need to be addressed. The first thing being that half of the films on my most anticipated list, half of the films that were meant to come out this year have been delayed either to next year or just indefinitely. And so this list is going to be a little bit weird. And what I mean by that is that perhaps the films on this list are not going to be quite as good and I don't like them quite as much as the films on the 2019 list or the 2018 list or whatever purely because of the lack of films. And I'm not saying that the films I've chosen are bad or anything, but had this been a normal year, I feel like most of them probably would have been on the honorable mentions or something. Which brings me to my second point, which is that I have not seen every single film that has come out this year, especially the smaller indie awards films, whether it be Pieces of a Woman or Minari or Nomadland, all of which I'm sure are terrific and probably would have been on my list had I seen them. One final thing before we get to the honorable mentions is the fact that I will not be ranking my own film. I will not be putting my own film on this list because that would be incredibly narcissistic and full of myself. And technically it's a 2021 release, but had it been on the list, probably would have been number one. Anyway, on to the honorable mentions. We have Birds of Prey, which was a really entertaining and relatively well put together film with some really good cinematography and also Ewan McGregor steals every scene that he's in and I cannot wait to see him return as Obi-Wan Kenobi. We have Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, incredible, incredible performances by Viola Davis and Chadwick Boseman, the late great Chadwick Boseman, both of which are completely Oscar worthy in more ways than one. We have The Trial of the Chicago 7, which in my opinion has the best ensemble cast of the year. That said, I personally did find Aaron Sorkin's script and his directing a little bit lacking in dynamism and perhaps would have been much better had the film not relied so much on dialogue. I mean, I genuinely do not think there was a single shot in the film without someone speaking in it. And then we have I'm Thinking of Ending Things, which was such a unique and unsettling and melancholic experience from none other than Charlie Kaufman. And although I did not personally connect too much to this film, it is one that I greatly admire. So onto the top 10, with number 10 being so I remember The Invisible Man being the last film that I saw before the entire world went into lockdown back in March. Elizabeth Moss is terrific in the film and Lee Wonell's direction is just incredibly precise and measured. And this is someone who knows how to use the filmmaking language to craft tension and to craft suspense and create these really intense scenes that feel earned. And aside from being a very effective psychological horror slash thriller, it also does a really good job of being, you know, a relatively interesting character piece as well. And so I really admire the work that Lee Winnell was able to do with this film and very much look forward to seeing what he does next. It's gonna be a beautiful wedding. I think we can all agree at this point that the Groundhog Day genre has become very bland and stale and, well, repetitive, with the exception of perhaps Edge of Tomorrow. And Palm Springs comes along and in many ways revitalizes this genre because this is a film that is so incredibly excited to be alive. This is a film that is having so much fun on every frame. And ultimately, this is a film that is essentially a really optimistic love story. And so I feel like it's a film that anyone and everyone who's made it to the end of 2020 will really, really appreciate. And I certainly did. Borat's subsequent movie film. Borat's subsequent movie film is one of the biggest sort of our most unexpected surprises of 2020. It is a film that I think many people are surprised actually exists. I certainly still am. And one of the things that I admire most about this film is that people always say, if they remade Borat in 2020, if they got that first film and they release it in 2020, it wouldn't work because too many people would be too offended. And the fact that they're able to make the sequel in 2020 and maintain the audacious nature of the tone, the audacious nature of the character is something I greatly, greatly admire. And as I'm sure many of you will agree, the film also has 
a surprising amount of heart, more so than its predecessor. And despite the fact that it's not quite as funny and it's not quite as bold as the first film, that extra level of emotion is something that I think does the film a lot of favors. It also is probably the most politically biased film that has come out this year. But despite that, Borat 2 has a great sense of universality and it has themes and messages and jokes that I think anyone and everyone can get behind. Wonder Woman 1984 has already become quite a controversial film. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's not a mess, because it is. It is an absolute mess of a film, but it's a mess that I personally really enjoyed. And I do feel like the over-the-top, the vibrant tone and atmosphere and style, and the fact that they've really appreciated and embraced the campy nature of the character, the campy nature of the, this particular world, and the optimistic nature of this world, I really admire that and I had a lot of fun with it. I think Patty Jenkins' direction for the most part is really, really solid. And despite, you know, me myself having mixed feelings on one or two of the creative choices, I do appreciate that they went for it and they, you know, they weren't kind of holding back, so to speak. And they, they had that confidence to go there. And of course you have Pedro Pascal, who's having an incredible, incredible 2020 and Hans Zimmer with his score and, you know, the fact that this film uses Beautiful Lie, which is my personal favorite piece of DC music in this new chunk of, you know, of the universe. Uh, so I was very happy to hear that piece and it definitely made me like the film a lot more. The Gentleman is such a cool and slick and entertaining film with an incredible, incredible ensemble cast. The screenplay packs a really great level of density and dynamism. There's a lot that goes on and it's weaved together in a way that doesn't feel like the generic gangster film, which I really admire from Guy Ritchie. Of course, you have Matthew McConaughey, you have Henry Golding, Charlie Hunnam was terrific, so was Michelle Dockery. What a great cast, but the reason this film is so high up for me is because of the effect that it had on me personally. Because I saw this film very early on in cinemas back in January with a few of my friends the day before we would go on to shoot our first short film of 2020, which was Cigarettes, Regrets and Not So Empty Threats. So it means a lot to me and it feels very nostalgic because that experience feels like a lifetime ago. Because since then I have gone on to do, you know, as you would know if, if you've been following this channel for a while, I've gone on to do quite a lot. And so looking back on that experience, and the fact that, that was at the very beginning of 2020 and that the gentleman in many ways kicked off my film journey of 2020, it means a lot to me. And so aside from the fact that it's a really fun and well-made film, that's why it's so high up for me. Now Extraction is pretty surprisingly high on the list because I think in many ways this film came out once again at the right time for me. We were a month in or so into lockdown and into the fact that the world ended and this very surface level, but ultimately fun, fulfilling, satisfying, balls to the wall action film came out and took the world by storm in a way because it was just really well made and it was really fun and we all needed a bit of entertainment at that time. And I think it still holds up. I think that Sam Hargrave's direction is just incredible. I think Chris Hemsworth has proven with this film that he can be a very, very convincing action hero leading man outside of the MCU. I think that it has a very great international universal appeal. And ultimately, I love the fact that this is a film that knows what it is. It's not trying to be some big pretentious, you know, whatever. It's just a really, really well put together action film. And it definitely succeeds in what it's trying to be. And so I think that out of all of the big action films, you know, pure action films of this year, Extraction is far and away top tier, the best one. Now this film is a bit of a paradox for me because I think it's split very clearly into two parts. On the one hand, this is a film about the Vietnam War and about the trauma of being a soldier and, and, and the trauma of being an African-American fighting in Vietnam and the, you know, the horrible weight that comes with that. And that part of the film I found slightly flawed purely because sometimes the messages felt a little bit too heavy handed. And sometimes I felt like Spike Lee was just trying too hard to shove this message down my throat. The other half of the five bloods is basically four friends 
who would die for each other if they didn't kill each other first, coming together to embark on this incredible adventure. That part of the film I loved. I thought it was so well executed. The way that Spike Lee shifts from each aspect ratio, each timeline was done so well. You know, the script was really tightly packed despite being such a big and sprawling film. All of the performances, especially from Delroy Lindo, absolutely incredible. And the elegant simplicity of being able to see these four friends come together and just hang out and, and go on this fun adventure together and, and kind of go through all this shit together was so much fun to watch and something that I personally related to a lot. It also has, in my opinion, the most suspenseful scene perhaps of the entire year, which if you haven't seen the film, I won't spoil, but it involved Jonathan Majors stepping on something that he shouldn't have. And that for me was just brilliant, brilliant filmmaking. Moving on to number three. Okay, so this is, is high up, okay? And, and I completely understand if you've seen my Tenet video and you think, oh, why the hell does he have Tenet up so high? One of the big misconceptions perhaps from that video was that I didn't like Tenet. I do like Tenet. I enjoyed it a lot. I think this is an incredible film. It's, it's a very well done piece of cinema and it's a film that I greatly admire and I learn from a lot what to do and what not to do, you know, but it's flawed. And I was pointing out the flaws uh, that I had with Tenet but I still really, really like it. I think that Nolan, of course, is one of the few directors who's capable of pulling off something like this and making it somewhat convincing, despite the fact that I do have issues with the screenplay, despite the fact that the film is in many ways a bit of an unnecessarily overly convoluted, confusing mess, I still greatly appreciate the fact that it came out. The fact that it came out on the big screen, that I was able to enjoy it on the big screen, the, the epic nature of the film, the stylish nature of the film, the fact that, you know, someone on the planet, a filmmaker, is still able to make something like this and get it out there for people to see. Like I said, I think the reason I was perhaps a little bit disappointed with Tenet uh, initially, and still am to a certain degree, was because it's, it's Christopher Nolan, right? This guy's made some of my favorite films of all time. Inception is my favorite film of all time. But as I said in that video, if this film had been made by a no-name filmmaker, you know, a no-name upcoming filmmaker, I would have greatly admired it, you know, and I would have greatly enjoyed it. And perhaps it's the Christopher Nolan name that made me a little bit disappointed. But overall, I do think The Tenet is a good film and one that has more pros than cons. And one that I will go on to enjoy for years to come, just not as much, you know, nearly as much as some of Nolan's other work. Now, my number two and my number one picks are very equal. Uh, and they're completely different films, but they're very equal. And I like them both kind of equally in different ways. And I think, you know, which one's two and which one is one, I think completely depends on the day. My number two film of 2020 is... Soul is probably my favorite Pixar film in the last 10 years. I think I like it more than Inside Out and probably definitely more than Incredibles 2, maybe. Uh, this is such a beautiful, beautiful piece of cinema. And, and the reason I think I love it so much, like a lot of people have already been saying, is the fact that this film is so incredibly universal. This is not something that is made just for kids. This is something that everyone from every age group can relate to, can get on board with. And Soul is just a, such an inspirational film, one that is effective from a filmmaking point of view. It's gorgeous. The voice acting is terrific. The animation style, you know, it, it's so imaginative. But ultimately, this is a film about passion. It's a film about purpose. I would say that out of all of the films this year, this was the one that hit me the hardest on an emotional level and I related to the most. So for now, Soul is at number two. On to number one. Mank. 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 This is Harmon Mankiewicz, but we have to call him Mank. Mank is in many ways the complete opposite of Soul because my biggest issue with this film is that it's not quite as emotionally hard hitting as some of Fincher's other work, whether it be Seven or Fight Club or The Social Network or whatever, the film can sometimes feel a little bit cold and distant and devoid of emotion. But after having seen it twice now, I still really love it. And I still think this is such a brilliant, beautiful piece of filmmaking. If I had to choose a best picture and a best director, it's David Fincher, it's Mank. Because I love films and in a year where films and the industry has been truly tested. We get this film, Mank, that is a love letter in many ways and is 
this incredible homage to the beauty of cinema, but also to the complicated, toxic, and just downright stupid and maddening uh, nature of cinema as well. And it combines those two elements to create something truly complex and special. But at its core, you know, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or La La Land, you have David Fincher, one of the greatest working directors, one of the greatest directors of all time, in my opinion, making a film about why he appreciates films. And I love that beyond words. And even if Mank is cold and even if Mank is devoid of, you know, whatever, I still admire its love for films because it's how I feel. So there you have it, guys, my top 10 films of 2020. Do comment your top 10 down below. I'd love to hear what your favorite films were, especially because it's 2020. Despite the fact that 2020 has been a very, very horrible year for most people, I'm not afraid to say that this has been one of the most satisfying and fulfilling years of my life. And there's been a lot of horrible stuff that has happened, but there's also been so much great stuff. And it has truly been, once again, a life-changing year and one that I will never forget. And I do hope that I'm able to sort of continue that into 2021 and accomplish as much in the next year as I did this year, especially since there's going to be a lot of great films coming out next year, which I will cover in my most anticipated films of uh, 2021 video coming in a few days. So anyway, guys, have an incredibly, incredibly happy new year. I think we've all earned it. Thank you so much, guys, from the bottom of my heart for an incredible year and for sticking with me and for helping the channel grow. And I look forward to seeing what we do together in 2021. Thank you.